Uh, this morning I want to talk about the second domain of mindfulness, the contemplation of feeling, or in Pali, Vedana. And I'll just begin by reading out what the Buddha has to say about this practice. He says, how does a bhikkhu live contemplating feeling as feeling? Here, a bhikkhu, when experiencing a pleasant feeling, knows he is experiencing a pleasant feeling. When experiencing a painful feeling, he knows he is experiencing a painful feeling. When experiencing a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he knows he is experiencing a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. The contemplation of feeling is essentially knowing how we feel. And the Buddha talks about feeling in terms of three broad categories, pleasant, painful, and neither painful nor pleasant. Sometimes you find this translated as neutral, uh, but literally it's neither painful nor pleasant. Feeling is the translation of Vedana, which comes from the verb vedati, which means both to feel and to experience. So for the Buddha, feeling and experience are, are very intimately bound up. To experience something is to feel, and to feel is to experience. Essentially, it's contemplating Vedana is knowing how, how we feel. And although feeling is bound up with experience, we can lose touch with how we feel. If we ask, well, what do we mean by feeling? We could say that feeling is the flavour of the experience. It's like if we're eating, say, then there's a whole number of physical experiences that are bound up with eating. The the different physical sensations of the food, so it's hardness, it's softness, it's crunchiness, it's smoothness, texture, moisture, and so on. So there's all these sensations going on as we eat. But there's also the flavour of the food. And the flavour is not the sensations. But it's intimately linked with the sensations. If you didn't have the sensations, you wouldn't have the flavour. But it's not the sensations, it's different. Flavour is one of is one of the main ways which determines our response to the food how we are moved by the experience of eating whether we like it or don't like it whether we want more or don't want more if the flavor if is pleasant we are moved to take more if the flavor is unpleasant we are moved to stop if we don't know what the flavour is, or we can't find any flavour, we are moved to indifference. But what moves us is the flavour. And so, in in the same way, Vedana, or feeling, is the flavour of experience. The savouring of it. And experience always has this affective tone, or flavour. Experience has affect. And what we mean by affect is the capacity of something to move us. So you might say, I was very affected by that, I was moved by that, or I found that very moving. So affect has to do with influence, and it has to do with response and action, the kinds of the action that we take in response to an experience. We are moved by an experience. We are, we are moved to act, to do something. So these three basic flavours of experience, pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. If we register the experience as pleasant, we are moved to hold on to it. If we register it as painful, we are moved to resist or reject it and if, the, if we don't know what we are feeling, so the experience is neither painful nor pleasant, then we are moved 
to dullness, indifference, doubt and confusion. But in any event, we are moved. We are already moved by the experience. If, for example, we're contemplating Vedana of the body, the feeling of the body, then what we're focusing on is the flavour of the sensation rather than the sensation. The quality of pleasantness or painfulness or neither. And, and the distinction is very subtle because we're not used to making the distinction. So what I'd like to do is have an experiment in which we see if we can get a sense of what is meant by Vedana, by feeling. So if you get into your meditation posture, so into getting into the sitting posture, and experiencing the whole body, constructing the posture from the ground up and feeling the whole body. Experiencing the whole body and from there Tune into the movements within the body that indicate the breathing. Find those movements and focus in on them. And now, watch the breathing. Observe or witness the breathing. Watch the breathing and be alert to this relationship. And now, feel the breathing. Don't watch it, feel it. Is there any difference in the relationship between watching and feeling? If so, what is it? Just feel the breathing. Don't watch it.
and now go back to experiencing the whole body. And from there, ask yourself, how do I feel now? Allow your awareness to become intimate with that feeling. Don't bother to name it, just feel it. How do I feel now? So, is there any difference between watching and feeling? Or are they the same? Different? In what way? Sorry? What, what is? Feeling. Feeling is more general and watching is more specific? More precise. So watching is from the outside, yes. looking in, yes. and feeling is inside. Yeah. So feel, feeling sounds more intimate than watching. Yeah. Yep. Yep, Jolene. So, and it's so, softer when you're engaged. Mm. So becoming one with it, it's a softer experience and much more engaged with it. Mm. So watching is more detached, mm. separated. Mm. Mm. Anybody find no difference at all? Uh -huh. So more, more detail in the feeling. What about, could you put that detail into words? Could you describe that? Mm. Are, you, are you talking about the, the last bit when, we said, when I said, how do you feel? Yeah. Okay. So, that then when you thought, okay, how do I feel? That's when you started to open up to all sorts of experiences. So feeling, 
have that trigger of being much is be, of being open and, and being sensitive. Yeah. yeah. It's um, it's interesting. This little experiment doing exactly the same thing, exactly the same meditation object, but using a different concept to say, do this. Usually the standard instruction is watch the meditation object, so watch the breathing. And you frequently get this term, be the witness, which is very much watching. And some practices revolve around simply being the witness. But then you use, simply drop in a different term, feel it, and suddenly you get a different experience. It's quite interesting the way that the concept can condition the nature of the experience. It may be that when we say watch the breathing, what we're emphasising is consciousness. When we say feel the breathing, what we're emphasising is Vedana, feeling. So feeling, in a sense, is a different way of experiencing. It's still the experience, but it's a different emphasis on the experience. People get, um, uh, do report differences between the two. As was st said here, sometimes watching indicates a distant perspective. Feeling is much more intimate. For some people, watching is more specific and detailed while feeling is more general. For some, some people find that when they watch the breath, they experience it at one point, and when they feel it, they experience it somewhere else. Did anybody have that? You actually, the actual location sh shifted? Yeah, what? In the body, mm. yeah, yeah. P other people have reported the same thing. But feeling the breath is is it's a much more embodied kind of relationship. Quite interesting. These terms that we use, like I've been using Pali terms, but even the English words, watching, feeling. It's not that these have absolute, universally agreed upon meaning. We use words to read our experience, to make sense out of it, to get meaning from the experience. And that the words that we use are much more like poetry than science. It's not that there's an absolute objective meaning for watching and another absolute objective meaning for feeling. Rather, words evoke something. They evoke some aspect of experience. And it's very subtle, and it's very personal. The teachings are, in many respects, they're much more like poetry than science, even though they have this scientific flavour, you know, Buddhist psychology. And we tend to think of psychology as being scientific. In, in many respects, it's, it's, more, it's, it's more like poetry than science. So don't get caught up in the concept of feeling or of anything else. The concepts are just ways of reading experience. What's important is the experience. But if we have an experience, it's good to be able to name it, to be able to say what it is. That, it, first of all, enables us to communicate. But it also helps to fix the experience, to, to make it part of the furniture of the mind. If we have an experience and we have no words for it, it's easily forgotten and becomes quickly very obscure. But if we, if we have a word for it, it's like we can slide it away somewhere and, and it's somehow more available in the future. And it also ha is more likely to mean something to us. So it's the case of simply experiencing what's there and then proceed to a reading of it. Don't look for the concept, in other words. 
just stay with the experience and then find a concept that fits. Don't start with a concept and try to find where is it. One of the warnings about using Vedana as a meditation object, which I read in a book in Burma. In the Burmese, in, in Burma, uh, th there was, beginning in the 19th century, there was a, 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 a big revival in meditation practices. And there's all sorts, a whole number of different schools of meditation, particularly of insight meditation, vipassana. The two that are most popular and most well known in the West are the Mahasi method, which we're doing, and the Goenka, Ubakin Goenka method. But they're only two out of probably dozens of approaches. Uh, but most of them have never been exported. I was reading a book on one of these methods, which focuses, uh, uses Vedana in the body as the primary object. And the person writing the book warned, don't look for Vedana. Don't look for feeling, because it's already here. And we can miss it precisely because we're so busy looking for it. Often the hardest thing to find is what is most obvious. Because it's obvious, we take it for granted and we stop noticing it. And if we start to look for it, we begin by assuming that it's something special, that it's something that we don't already know, something that we haven't already experienced something which is somewhere else, not here. But in fact, it's already here. And we're already experiencing it. We just haven't tuned into it yet. It's quite subtle. The contemplation of Vedana can be quite subtle. The practice itself is very subtle. When we, when, when we talk about insight, often we, talk, we, we have the sense of, oh, this is something that I haven't got yet. And I have to go looking for it. But in fact, it's already here, it's already available. It's just a question of tuning in to what is already happening. That's, you know, as a general rule, that's how the practice works. Any um, questions or comments? So you're... Uh -huh. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting to examine resistance, uh, which is based on painful feeling. Painful feeling. If there's painful feeling, there's resistance. Resistance is, is how we are moved by painful feeling. And, and uh, just stay with it and observe it, or feel it, as the case may be. Now we start to get really self-conscious about what words we use. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, resistance is very interesting. There's always something there. Uh, emotion um, has feeling, but emotion is more than just feeling. Let's say if I have the emotion of irritation, for example, then usually there's a, there's a narrative going through the mind. There's a story. Often there's a body sensation associated with it. There's some tightness or stress in the body. There's the feeling of it. Usually it's painful. And there's something else as well. There's the, um, the essence of, of, the, of the emotion, the emotional tone, what the Buddha calls the citta. 
So there's, there's a, 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 an emotion is complex, it's made up of parts. But every emotion has feeling. But feeling would be one part of emotion. We use the term emotion a lot. The Buddha doesn't. There's no term in, in the Buddha's teachings which corresponds to our term emotion. And I think the reason is because it's too broad for him. He tends to be much more precise in his use of language and in his, in his awareness. Uh, you can you, you can label it. The the easiest way to label it would be with the first three: painful, pleasant, or neither. Neither is the most difficult to see. Pleasant and painful are the, are the obvious ones. You can either you, you you can play around with it. If you feel so moved, then you can make it your primary object. In which case, you tune into the feeling of something, and you could either name it or simply feel it. Some people find that naming feeling gets in the way of actual feeling. It's, it's too much of a consciousness thing. Uh, so you could, for example, just set yourself the job of, okay, now I'm just going to feel. I'm walking down the corridor. I'm going to feel what it's like to walk down the corridor. I'm going to feel what it's like to be eating lunch. I'm going to feel the breathing. I'm going to feel the experience of thinking and play with it just to get to know it just to see if there's, you know, if there's any difference. With all these things, don't, never take them too seriously. Treat them like a game. Play. And, and you just see what happens. And you always learn something. It doesn't matter what happens. You will learn something from the experience. But don't, never take it too seriously. Just play with it. And if the game is not satisfying, then you drop the game. And you go back to something else. Go back to what you normally do.